My name is Larry Jordan. I'm a member of West Falmouth Friends Meeting and I'm also uh, been asked by Erica Adams, the, you the person who has organized these seminars, to do the introduction today. So, uh, the West Falmouth Friends Meeting Peace and Social Order Committee is pleased to present Susan Cozen on her giving a talk today, Reimaging Redmond. Uh, I'm supposed to say that there will be a question and answer session following the talk, but please uh, post your questions in the chat rather than uh, asking them verbally. All right. Susan Cozens lives in downtown Redmond on the east side of Seattle area with her husband and near her daughter, son-in-law, and four grandchildren. She is a professor emerita at Georgia Tech in the field of public policy with special research interests in innovation and inequality. Presently, Susan is clerk of Quaker Voice, an advocacy organization addressing political policy at the state level in Washington State. She also coordinates a network of similar Quaker state level legislative action groups in other states. She has served on the board of the American Friends Service Committee and the General Committee of the Friends Committee on National Legislation. Currently, she is on the board of the Quaker Institute for the Future, uh, and uh, she gave this talk at their uh, sem summer seminar this past August. Susan is a member of Eastside Quaker Meeting in Bellevue, Washington. Uh, the talk today is about Redmond, Washington, an affluent eastern suburb of Seattle, which has developed a racially exclusive uh, neighborhood consciously. Uh, the presentation will share some of the history of that racialization and point to institutions that would need to change to transform that into a place of racial justice. Now, I think you'll find this talk to be much deeper than that. In my opinion, it points to the inherent weaknesses that have crept into human character as civilization in different versions has developed over this globe and evolved over the past 15,000 years or more to the present and coalesced into one large global civilization which has all of today's current problems. That's what I hope you'll get out of this. And with that, I give it over to Susan. Wow, okay, so my task just expanded <laughs> dramatically. Thank you for that introduction, Larry. And I wanna let you all know in West Falmouth that this is actually our meeting house in um in Bellevue behind me that I'm not there they'll be meeting in a little less than an hour in this room um but um this is what our meeting house looks like so thank you very much for the invitation it's um it's interesting starting to share this work I really thank uh Quiff, the Quaker Institute for the Future I thank Larry first of all for making me conscious of of Quiff and then also for it's just being there to really be a wonderful um, uh, nurturing environment for work of this sort, which is the intersection between very deep uh, moral issues and um, and research and analysis. So I hope you'll you'll see that in what I'm going to uh, present, which is actually reimagining uh, Redmond. So let's see whether I can get this to, yeah, there we go. So uh, let me say, first of all, where Redmond is, what it is, and then why I'm taking a look at, at Redmond. So on the where is Redmond, we're up in the Northwest corner of the US in this story that you're about to hear. Um, the actual, the northwesternmost corner of the US is, is over here of the continental uh, U.S. It's actually uh, the Macaw Indian Reservation. Fascinating uh, nation. Um, we've got uh, the edge of the continental shelf uh, 
created mountains here and then volcanoes over here, the Puget Sound uh, comes in between. And I show this map because of these big brown areas, in fact, um, which are our reservations. And they're the more visible reservations. Many of the reservations are quite small, but it's part of the reality of this area that um, the Native Americans are right there. I mean, you don't have to sort of pretend they are still here. They are definitely still here, a force in state politics in a variety of ways. And that's part of our racial history in the uh, Redmond area. So I will go to the next map while somebody mutes who needs to mute out there. Great, thank you. So here we've got a little bit of a, a close up. We've got the Puget Sound over here and the city of Seattle, which you know. Uh, right here. I'm assuming somebody should tell me if you can't see my cursor moving. But um, uh, on the eastern side of Seattle is Lake Washington. Um, and the east side, which I'm talking about, is literally the east side of Lake uh, Washington. And Redmond is this kind of jigsaw puzzle piece over here. Uh, back off the, the edge of the lake a little bit, and that's actually important. As white settlers came in, they were linked to Seattle, the commercial hub, by water, by ferries and that sort of thing. And so they settled right along the coast. And it's a part of the reality of Redmond that it wasn't part of that set of settlements so much. You'll hear more about that, but um, is back a little bit. And I just want you to see the two bridges that are going to figure in the story later as well that crossed Lake Washington and turned this area into an automobile suburb rather than a, than a ferry sur suburb. Uh, what is Redmond? It is, as my abstract said, an affluent suburb. Just to give you some numbers, there's about 72,000 people living there in 2019 uh, with a 30% increase from 20, 2010, over a 30% increase. Uh, the um, median value of homes, according to the American Community Survey, is a little over 700,000, and the median household income is um, uh, 132,000. So I hope that this counts even in the standards of West Falmouth as an affluent um, community. I hope that speaks to it. But then we've got the question of why Redmond. So uh, the superficial answer on that is because it's where I live. Um, but there's a much deeper reason than that, too, that makes it more worthwhile for you to, to listen to this and see in what ways it speaks to you. Uh, we uh, moved here in 2018, and I was starting to feel uncomfortable with how darn comfortable the place is, even before the George Floyd murder. But when George Floyd was killed, in the uprising that followed that, I really had to sit and face the question of what are the ethical implications of living in a place like this? We're not moving anywhere um, because of the, the family connection here. So it really made me have to grapple with uh, what is Redmond for me. And what came out of that was a whole new, um, a part of my anti-racist life in which I really had to think about structural racism. What are the structural elements that are out there? Um, and what should I be doing about, with them uh, at this point? So that's where the Reimagining Redmond Project came from for me. And I'm gonna be sharing a little of that with you today. Um, I'll run through a little bit of uh, history um, we'll try not to spend more than half of the presentation on that. I'm married to a historian, so it's, it's kind of a family tendency that we learn a lot from history. I hope you'll learn a lot from um, at least a bit from the history of Redmond as well, but it certainly shapes who we are. The, going through the different periods of Redmond's um, uh, development. And then I want to spend about half the time on the actual reimagining uh, Redmond. <clears throat> part of the presentation because I've kind of identified three areas where I feel like I can engage um, and that reflect structural racism in various ways. And I'll tell you where the engagement 
uh, stands um, for me with my Quaker uh, community out here. The themes that you will certainly see uh, running through the presentation are uh, race and wealth. So um, the people actually appear on that landscape that you've been looking at the map of quite, quite early. This is a sign that, that I um, get to when I go out of my apartment building from the, from the rear and go to the left about a half mile. And it, it points to an archeological dig um, near a little creek, it's just a little insignificant creek running through Redmond called Bear Creek, at least it looks insignificant to us. But there were people there as much as 14,000 years ago. There's a, a tool um, a kind of pile that uh, was discovered in this archeological dig. So people were making tools that they used in fishing and in hunting, and they're able to actually track the things that they were fishing and, and hunting in various ways. Uh, so these people go, go way, way um, back. The place has been occupied for a long time. Uh, they're not directly traceable to the Native American groups um, that were in Redmond when the white settlers arrived. Um, the, this is um, Ed Davis's um, family. Ed is kind of in the back with his wife and this is Hazel petting the sheep and her little sister, Elizabeth. Uh, these are members of the Sammamish tribe and it's the Sammamish that I name in my land acknowledgement um, because they kind of sit right on Lake Sammamish, but this is actually um, after the white settlers arrived, but the Native Americans were still in the area. Uh, the early stories of Redmond are very peaceful uh, stories, cooperative stories about Native families that were in the place where the, the white settlers um, came. Um, and then eventually they were just overwhelmed. There's still a few Native Americans around in our population profile, but a very small percentage. Oh, good, I've got my, um, I can switch it a different way. So here's the kind of version of, of Redmond history that's told by the Redmond Historical Society. It's very much settler history. It's very um, white settler oriented. The first people in the area were fur trappers. That's true with the whole, the first white people, I'm sorry, were fur trappers, not Americans, but French and British. There were lots of salmon running in the Sammamish River and, and in Bear Creek. And then in 1871, um, uh, a couple of white settlers uh, come over on the side of the lake and start uh, staking claims. Their greatest challenge, according to this history, was clearing the towering trees that uh, were so wide that they had no equipment that could really go through them. And this is, you see this picture a lot of, of two guys standing on the end of really long saws that they had to work back and forth. And it would take two days to bring down one of these trees, which is just um, horrifying to those of us who realize what those native forests were, what the old growth forests were, and they were just getting in the way of these um, settlers. But they did figure out, Perigo and, and McRedmond came to farm, but the loggers pretty soon figured out that all those trees that were getting in the way were um, going to bring them a lot of money. And so they started pouring into the valley where uh, Redmond now is that sawmill that was opened in 1890. We still see the, the wooden um, uprights for that sticking out of Lake Sammamish when my husband and I ride our bikes past that area. And the railway that was opened in the uh, 1880s to take the logs out is actually, of course, was converted into the bike trail that we're, we're riding on when we do that. Um, everything was built with, with wood. And so you've got a bunch of, uh, loggers. I think it was a very masculine environment at that point and um, sort of getting rowdy and there was a tendency to fires. So they incorporated in 1912 so that they could build waterworks to put out the fires in the, the uh, wooden houses. And then according to the, central, uh, the uh, settler history, the logging faded in the 1920s. And you know what that means. That means they had taken down all the trees that they could. And then farming takes over. And again, the farmers are sort of, the, if you've ever seen a logged uh, field, 
it's just full of these huge um, uh, uh, stubs, the stumps of the trees. And so the farmers were working for a long time getting those uh, out of the field as agriculture became the mainstay in the settler history. Um, but there's a lot that that settler history leaves out. I mean, just an enormous amount. Part of it is why and how were the relationships between the native families that were in the area and the early white settlers, how was it that that was such a friendly relationship? Well, um, in it was 1855 when the territory um, was made part of the US that uh, the US sent somebody to set up a bunch of treaties and get rid of the natives who were in town and send them off to reservations. So there was no question of where the power relationships were between Ed Davis and his family and the white settlers. And that's part of how they got along. Um, but the, none of that is told in the settler history story, how that settlement was, um, was framed by these uh, treaties, which of course were uh, broken almost immediately. Um, it doesn't tell anything about why there were uh, not African Americans here, and that's woven into the history of the Northwest, the Northwest Territories, which were brought in at, at times um, when there was a question of are we going to add slave or free um, areas to, to the US, and so this was an area that was expected to be um, free of slavery, which meant actually in practice um, that the Northwest would, um, would um, be a very unfriendly place for black folks, let's put it that way. Oregon actually had a law in, if you were black and you showed up in Oregon, you were subject to um, whipping 60 lashes and that would just continue until you left. And so, the smart people who came through there did keep going. They came up to Washington where they still weren't allowed to, um, the ownership rules were different if you were black. The settler history leaves out the, um, tells about railroads. I mean, even the Redmond story has a railroad in it, but it doesn't talk about the Asian labor, the Chinese labor that was brought in to build those railroads, the uh, conditions, uh, um, anything having to do uh, with that group. And it doesn't say anything about, I mean, I'm using Mexicans rather than uh, uh, Latinx at this point, because it was mostly Mexicans that were in the area. Again, with particular places in the division of labor, there were Mexican mule teams. This seems to be something that was an accept acceptable place in the, the what settlers wanted to make the Northwest. Um, and I use these groups because um, all four of these groups that I've named here were subject to lynching in the Northwest, which is, uh, uh, was a complete surprise to me as I started to learn about it. But um, it, the smaller numbers certainly than the Jim Crow, the horrors of the Jim Crow era in the, the South, but all these groups uh, were lynched. Um, the, um, the Japanese woman on the, the right here is part of a Japanese settlement in Bellevue, which was right over by the lake um, uh, near where Redmond uh, was eventually established. Japanese have, had actually been in the Belgi Bellevue area for quite a long time, but were not allowed to actually own their land. And even the, um, the relationships that let them farm in the area were broken in World War II when they were sent off, sent off to the in, in internment camps. Um, on the, the left-hand side, uh, maybe I should switch these, these pictures in terms of the side of the picture, but at any rate, you've got the Ku Klux Klan here marching in the 20s. And in fact, Redmond was the home for a neo, um, no, um, a, a fascist movement led by a guy who declared himself to be the U.S. Hitler. It was called the Silver Shirts um, and was really a, a a Nazi movement. So um, none of this will you really find in the Redmond Historical Society account of how the town grew. Um, one of the big uh, changes on the east side 
came with the automobile age. Those two bridges that I showed you in the map, one of them was built in the 40s and the other, I believe in, in the 60s. And the one in the 40s in particular, this is the area that it came into that allowed automobiles to go back and forth between um, uh, Seattle City and this side. And that allowed a lot more growth. Um, it, the timing coincided with the period following World War II when GIs had um, mortgage help available through the GI Bill. And those of you who know the story of the GI Bill will know where this one's going, which is that Black uh, GIs ha had access to the, to the money, but not to the housing to use it on, and actually were turned down for mortgages even with uh, GI Bill offers. So what happens is the automobile age and uh, that subsidy from the federal government um, just subsidizes a big white movement onto the east side, while um, the um, African-Americans who had come to the Seattle area for the very plentiful um, shipbuilding and defense jobs during World War II um, are left behind in the central district of Seattle that they had been confined to um, in that era. So the, the image that's given to these um, white Seattleites who are coming to the east side is that they are leaving the dirty crowded city and coming into the uh, gorgeous um, uh, tree covered um, uh, rural paradise of the east side uh, with the, this is the I-90 bridge taking them over here. The reality is a little different. From, from that, they've got big interchanges because the highways are big, that the trees have been taken down to make room for the suburbs that they're uh, moving into, but it's still, it's a good area. So the next big um, transformation for Redmond in particular comes in the 60s when high technology companies start moving in. And you will see a name that you recognize uh, quite, clearly uh, kind of down on that list. We've got some uh, companies coming in earlier, but when Microsoft decides to uh, set up its main campus in Redmond in 1986, there's a real um, kind of sea change that happens in the uh, area. I love where Microsoft's uh, headquarters moved in. They bought a chicken farm from an Italian family um, to uh, become the Microsoft main campus. And, and some of you may know that Italians were uh, subject to prejudice and discrimination at that point as well, but I hope they did really well for Microsoft. I haven't heard how much Microsoft uh, paid for that. But since then, uh, really, because Microsoft is such a big name, if any of you heard of Redmond before I started, uh, talking today, it was probably because it's the, the world headquarters for Microsoft. So that has certain implications for your community and who's in your community as these quotations from um, the uh, Historical Society website indicate. Uh, the corporate giants bring them in an influx of workers from other countries. Please note this, making Redmond a much more diverse town than just a few decades earlier. And it continues to grow and evolve as a dynamic city, but it doesn't move beyond. And look at the last phrase here, the pioneer spirit. So we're going to um, stay pioneers. I don't know for how long we're gonna consider ourselves pioneers. Anyway, that's the next era of Redmond growth. And then here's, uh, this is an artist rendition just because I don't know where this person was standing, but anyway, this is the Microsoft uh, campus. Um, into which pre-COVID 47,000 Microsoft employees poured on a daily basis. And then they had around them um, uh, support staff, most of whom it, Microsoft just hires outside contractors to do all these kind of support services. So if you recall your numbers from the beginning, I said there were 72,000 people living in, um, in Redmond, living in Redmond, spending overnight in Redmond in, um, 
in 2019. And then some of those come to work on the Redmond campus, but a lot of people come from other places too. And, and that actually becomes kind of an important part of the picture of what life in the city is about. And this gets to be important when I get to the police part of the story. So you see daytime population of 135,000. So the place grow almost doubles in size during the day in terms of the number of people who are moving around and they don't all have to be able to afford to live in, in, in Redmond. Um, so it gets much more interesting. Uh, the median home value is a little different from what I gave you, but this is the sale prices rather than a, a value uh, price. And if you look at the population, this is the people who live there in the middle of this diagram. Let me help you a little bit with this pointer. 86 is when Microsoft bought the, the chicken farm and started building and you see the population uh, going way up with the uh, projection for 2030 of 78,000. And then the number of jobs in this bottom uh, row with the big leap between 86 and 90 and a lot of growth uh, after that point. Lots of other companies then cluster around, at least put installations in the area because uh, Microsoft is there. So um, I have to just give this kind of statistical um, portrait. I wasn't able to find things that were always just for Redmond. Uh, City King County is the county where Redmond is located. And I just picked up this graphic to illustrate something about those people from other countries that the high technology growth was bringing into the, uh, the area. And that is that um, those folks are overwhelmingly uh, of Asian ancestry. Many of them are Asian immigrants. If I had had the, Im the immigrants in Redmond, actually the um, median income is much higher than for um, uh, uh, people who were not born in other, other countries. And this just is showing which group is actually producing the growth in the area. Um, and it shows the, the uh, dominance of people. Again, because the Census Bureau really weird um, categories, some of these people are Asian Americans, some of them are Asian uh, immigrants, but Asian is a, is a, is a big uh, category that comes up. And the influence of that then on incomes is also uh, clear. So Seattle's Asian household. Just it, for those who don't know, Redmond is not the only place in the area that has high technology development. Amazon is this huge dominant force in the city of Seattle itself. So they're a little differently located, but both of them just um, hiring uh, very highly trained computer professionals at at very high rates. And so this doubling of household, this soaring uh, household income for Asians is not because people were getting paid more, it's because people were being hired into very high paying jobs um, in, in the area. So that is part of our uh, reality. Redmond actually has the highest percentage of people who fall in the census category of Asian of any city in the state of uh, Washington at about uh, about a third. Um, oh, okay, but you can see here, 36% uh, Asian in 2019 in the um, American Community Survey data. Again, that, it, you know, just be clear that this is not all immigration, um, that there um, are anyway, lots of Asian Americans in that group too. So I'm just um, going to and with this, which is just a little bit of a future development for the area. You remember we had the railroad back in 1888, bringing logs in and out of the area, and then switched from ferries to cars driving across the lake. But now we're going to have light, light rail coming right into Redmond. The Redmond Technology Station over here, that actually is right next to the Microsoft campus, which is in that area and it will be open within uh, months at this point. And then within a couple of years, light rail will come all the way from downtown Seattle 
into downtown Redmond, Washington. And this is the artist rendition of our, our um, stop that's gonna be a few blocks from where I live. Um, and what happens when light, light rail comes? Fill in the blank. <gasps> a lot of apartment buildings <laughs> get built. This one is actually right across the street from, from our building. This was last summer, it's much further along um, now. Uh, but anyway, the number of, of uh, apartment buildings has, I believe, doubled since um, my husband and I moved here in 2018. They're expecting a lot of people to want to come in by that uh, on the light, light rail and live in um, luxury apartments in, in Redmond. Um, and the irony of this is partly that apartment building is one of those code words that uh, white folks fleeing to the suburbs into their single family homes used it was, it was a danger signal at certain points in that migration into the suburbs. Um, poor people lived in apartment buildings. Um, and you will still hear that attitude among longtime uh, Redmond residents, even though the people, I'm telling you the prices in these apartments um, are, um, are significant enough that this is a very inaccurate uh, stereotype that's being. Um, that's uh, still being articulated sometimes. Okay, so I think that does it for the, for the history. I wanna to turn to the question of, uh, uh, seems like a nice place, what do we really need to reimagine about uh, Redmond? The background here is, the, um, is a strategic plan, a big kind of 20 year strategic vision and plan statement that the city uh, put together. And I use that as a background in part because that's actually my building over here. This is this is the building where I live. You can't see our, our unit, but um, uh, there it is. But the thing that strikes me in reading this plan is that there are all kinds of wonderful things. There's like 30 goals to for the city of Redmond um, to for um, uh, to move into for the future. None of them have to do with who's benefiting from those wonderful things that Redmond is intending to, um, uh, to put in place and is working on. And at the same time, in the state of Washington, we know that there are people who are not getting anywhere close to those, uh, those wonderful uh, public features that Redmond is working on. We know that uh, Black, Washingtonians and Native Americans are more likely to be homeless. They are more likely, the children are going to um, uh, schools that are not as well um, resourced in general. They're more likely to be renters than, than homeowners, which means that on our like 15% increase in housing prices over the last year, the renters are struggling to make their rent. The homeowners are um, just watching their net worth go up. Um, there's lower family incomes among Blacks and Native Americans, and then the huge gaps in, in wealth that we're all um, getting to be so familiar with at this point. A lot of it linked to home ownership. We'll get onto that in a minute. At the same time, the Hispanic population, which is still heavily Mexican, but more diverse than just Mexican, are much more likely to be in uh, the service industries and uh, farm workers. And so our COVID-19 profile in this state was really dominated by very high infection rates um, and limited hospitalization uh, facilities, um, uh, the wrong kind of housing environment to go through um, a, um, an aerosol borne infection uh, pandemic. And that meant that actually our Latinx uh, residents were the ones who were much more likely to suffer from COVID and, and die. So we've got all of this disparity in the state. So the, the, the deep question is still, how is it that Redmond, what needs to be reimagined about Redmond is for Redmond to share more of what it has with all, with everybody in Washington and not be so darn comfortable. Okay, 
So the three areas, as I said, that as, as I've really sat with the structural racism, the three areas that I've uh, taken to try to, to work on part of my uh, agenda are housing, uh, police and schools. And that's what I'm gonna talk about for the next probably 10, maybe 15 minutes. Um, so the housing area is really hard. I mean, I just want you to think about where you live, the kinds of housing around you and say, okay, well in 10 years, what could we change about that? And the answer is probably gonna be very little because housing moves so slowly as structural racism goes. Housing is very structural. It is the built uh, environment. Um, and yet the segregation that we created in housing in the US is a major, major factor driving a lot of the other things that separate us and that create the disparities. Um, my, I really recommend, I've got two, two highly recommended readings at the bottom of this slide. One is The Warmth of Other Suns by Isabel Wilkerson, wonderful um, oral history interlaced with um, uh, systematic survey data on uh, the creation of ghettos um, in northern cities as uh, from the Great uh, Migration. Um, it, it, segregation is not something that folks have opted into. It has been Forced. And then The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein really documents wham, 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 the federal actions, policies, and programs that required segregation, that created segregation where it didn't exist before, that made us a segregated country, and that is now built that way. So those suburbs that that grew up on the east side um, in the Seattle area that I showed you pictures of, uh, they're not going anywhere soon. That's built environment. It is built segregated by federal uh, policies. Um, and I've got a bunch of them listed on this slide too. Um, uh, public housing that replaced integrated neighborhoods with segregated public housing. Um, uh, mortgages denied based on a uh, risk that were only that the only reason for the risk was the um, the racial composition of the neighborhood and exclusionary zoning. Once some of this stuff became illegal and no longer federal policy or federal programs and exclusionary zoning kind of took over. And so you could say, here's the kind of structure we want in our area. And that became a de facto um, uh, segregator as well. And, but the um, keeping, but all these obstacles, all these um, uh, inhibitions for African-Americans in homeowning, then, uh, really has fed into the enormous gaps in, in wealth between uh, white and black Americans and uh, other people of color at home. My big shock on this was the existence of contract home uh, purchases. I won't ask you to raise your hands and think how many of you out there know what a contract home purchase is, but I, I never heard of this because my, uh, my white suburban family always had what was called a conventional mortgage, but a contract home purchase, you don't build up any, um, any equity at all. And if you miss a single payment, the whole contract can be wiped out. You lose everything you uh, put into it. Um, and um, that was what uh, black and brown families were, were offered largely. So there's a lot of baggage here. And all I have to do is look around Redmond to see a whole bunch of that baggage. And here's actually our zoning map, which is one of the places that you can see that. Here's our jigsaw puzzle again. And all these yellow areas are zoned um, single family residential. Um, and so that kind of protects the historic character of Redmond. This area, the red area down here is multifamily, and that's where all those 
uh, apartment buildings are, um, are going up. So the city of Redmond on its website says, oh, we are doing all kinds of wonderful things for making Redmond a diverse uh, place to live in the, the housing area. We've got rent controlled units and buildings, and that's true in, in my building, although I believe there's a time limit on that and it may expire soon. We allow associated dwelling units and duplexes, and we provide some funding for affordable housing. Um, there's a bunch of programs listed, and this part of my agenda is to learn more about these uh, programs. Um, and we do have a homeless outreach professional. Uh, we don't have a lot of homeless folks wandering around, but there is somebody who's devoted to, um, to reaching out uh, to them. So Redmond says it's doing a lot of good things, um, but this needs to be assessed and, and can be pushed uh, further, I'm sure. The reason I labeled this reparations is because given what was on the previous slide, given all of this uh, federal activity uh, in our lifetimes, um, it, any, any affluent white American could trace part of their current wealth to the disparities created by these public policies. If there's an area where reparations are due, um, they're due in a lot of places, but this is one where there are things that can be, be done. So we'll see. Um, there, um, we're gonna be fighting for some state legislation on the, um, uh, to, on inclusionary zoning this year. And that'll be part of my program. My deep feeling about that is because of the exploration that I've been doing in Redmond. Um, police is the second. Uh, area. I really looking at the um, the march downtown, the Black Lives Matter march in downtown Redmond, and the very friendly police protecting the marchers all on their bicycles and all kinds of stuff. I thought, well, what does it take to have a friendly police force? You know, what kind of environment does that come from? And it was contrasted with at least what I was reading in the media in terms of uh, police community relations in the city of Seattle. So started, I was just kind of puzzling over it uh, some and talked to the other members of Eastside Meeting who live in Redmond. We actually live all over the, the place, but there were four of us at that point that lived in, in Redmond. We said, well, let's just find out more about our Redmond uh, Police Department. So we tried taking a look at the budget, um, turns out we spend a whole lot of money on our friendly uh, police force. And one of the rationales for spending so much when you look at it per capita of people who sleep here is because of that doubling of the population during the, the day. We, we developed some questions. We talked to the police chief. We had a new po police chief. Um, uh, and he is actually African-American. He came to us from uh, California. So we had a, a talk with him and asked him some of our questions. We asked for some data on um, uh, stop and arrest data by race. And then our education really started. I don't expect you to be able to read this, but let me tell you what it, what it says. And that is when we looked at the, um, at the proportions by race for criminal and non-criminal offenses. This is arrest data for our little Redmond Washington, the disproportionality in the black category stood out. I think you'd agree with me that it stands out these huge things and particularly on the criminal side. So um, we were so shocked by these numbers. We sent them right off to Chief Lowe and said, look what we found in your numbers. The black people are um, eight, nine times more likely than their um, than their population percentages to be arrested in criminal um, categories in Redmond. Uh, what are you gonna do about that? Uh, we, they actually in, uh, got us involved in, um, in a data dashboard project that they had because we look like data wonks, these little Quaker ladies who just love data. Um, and they sent us some more data that was even more detailed. And that's where we came up with the analysis that's that's partly represented here. Um, the the profile of which offenses 
were folks being arrested for or charged with even in Redmond was quite different again for black folks here for whatever reason um, versus the other uh, racial groups. And this is, if things happened only as often as the population percentages, they're at this red line or below. So a whole bunch of the offenses that um, black people were being arrested for in Redmond were disproportionate. And, but these gray areas are really interesting because they're right up toward the, the largest end of the disproportionality. And those are ones where there's discretion for the uh, arresting officer. We called them challenging interactions. Quakers, you know, are very good at, um, at euphemisms. And this was a, a euphemism. So really this, on the one hand, what the police were telling us was that there's a lot of racism in the community that they get called for various things, but this said to us, we need to pay attention to implicit bias on the part of the police too. Now I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna flip through some of this. Um, so we are still engaged in this dialogue uh, with the police and I've listed some of the things we've been doing here. Our latest uh, conversation, actually we discovered they're taking implicit bias training very seriously, the whole city is and we're going to we're monitoring that we like the fact that we're out there and we let them know that we're we're watching and we're considering taking on some community projects to kind of partner with them on what they're um, doing um, starting with the stores because shoplifting is one of the areas where there's a lot of um, of fear rhetoric there's this fear tape that runs in people's heads and it causes harassment um, and disproportion. Another one of our euphemisms is uneven distressful attention. We're really trying to do things that would keep Redmond from being a street to prison pipeline, particularly because of the uneven distrustful attention, um, AKA uh, racial profiling. All right, so just a word on schools. Um, the school issue is very closely related to the housing uh, segregation uh, issue. And we do have great schools uh, in Redmond and we would uh, just like those to be safe places for everyone and, um, and available to um, more people. So the inclusionary zoning issue, the opening up Redmond to more different kinds of housing actually starts to open up the school environment as well. And there's a lot of research that shows that um, kids from poor families being in good schools do enormously better um, in terms of their long-term outcomes than those that go to school only with other uh, poor kids. Um, and at the same time, um, we are hooking into groups that are concerned about the Black experience in Lake Washington School District, which is our, our school district. Um, and the, the students really want to get the police out of the, the schools. I won't regale you with stories of the ways that we do still have school resource officers, which is a big national movement to get rid of those. And those school resource officers are making life hard for Black and Brown kids uh, in the, the Redmond schools. We're working with some other uh, community groups on those. I mean, all four of us, you now five of us that live in, in Redmond can't do much on our own. So we're reaching out in various ways. And sometimes those alliances make you recognize what you're doing as a Quaker. I'll just tell one story from the school resource officer work. And that is I've been meeting with a, with a group, a sort of general progressive group from the East side for a while on this. And I finally told them, you know, I'm really uncomfortable with the way the word cop is being used in our meetings. And there's this shocked silence. Oh, you think it's disrespectful? And I said, well, yeah, the people doing this are people. Um, and uh, after another shot, and there's another um, a person from Eastside Friends meeting actually in the group. And he said, oh yeah, I agree with you. That it's just being used in a kind of derogatory uh, way and then somebody says, "Oh, we can tell you're Quakers." 
So at any rate, uh, alliances are, are gonna be fun and we are working at state level with the state level um, lobby group. So that, uh, with this why Redmond question that I raised at the beginning, as a social scientist, I ask, okay, what is Redmond a case study of? And at this point, I understand it as a case study of affluent US suburbs built in the way many of them were with, with um, uh, in many ways, some of the same uh, politics created by structural racism um, through a particular history in ways that are particularly difficult to address because of privilege and because of the level of comfort that comes with it. And because here, we can live here, I could live here for a year and never think about any of these issues if I wanted to. It's not forced on me in any way by the uh, environment. So with that, I have um, tried to incorporate my own consciousness of those issues in my daily prayers. And so I uh, invite you to pray with me, uh, but only, only for the white folks out here, not for people of color out there, but recognizing our unearned privilege and benefits and um, praying to the creator to do something today to spread those benefits more widely. And I will close with that. Larry or Clyde, do you want me to take the slides down? Or shall we sit with this one for a moment? Sit with this one as, 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 as you like. OK, so I left a few minutes for Q&A. Um, as the nominal host of this, I'm not sure uh, how we're conducting this. It said that we were supposed to submit questions in a chat or something. And I'm, does anyone know how we are doing that? I don't know. There... There's nothing in the chat, Larry. Yeah. Larry, I would suggest no. that there being nothing in the chat that we just open the floor for questions. There aren't very many people on the, on the session. So it should be manageable if, you, if you're willing to moderate that. Okay, look, why don't we proceed with that? And uh, I guess if I take my thing off of presenter view and I can see everybody uh, yeah, in the gallery, then yeah, I can begin to see that it appears that we have a certain number of people. And uh, I see a hand over there with the Tomax. Did you want to? Yeah. Ask? Yes, um, I just hear wonderful effort that um, Quakers are making, but the structure is the same. Um, I mean, it's not going to change that much if the structure stays the same. It seems in a societal, um, I've been trying to study societal wellness, societal uh, health, shall we say, um, really is influenced by religion and schooling. And um, I don't know what, what's in the issue about religion or schooling that this continues in the richest country in the world. It's really, uh, at least an as an educator, I'm concerned about that localities decide their own school uh, rules. Right there, you, 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 you start uh, and build in uh, inequality. Um, what if, uh, it might be very hard to think of in this country, but what if all elementary schools were um, given the same amount of resources by federal government instead of every local thing different? That, then that poor child, uh, you wouldn't even know who's poor, who's not. I mean, they could wear uniforms or something, but um, that has worked in other countries. 
um, I mean, it's like if you live in Wellesley Hills as opposed to Dorchester, you, you, you're right there. Um, uh, the spirit is there, <laughs> you know, um, doing a lot of research uh, outcomes, childhood outcomes. I remember um, uh, the professor saying, what are you asking? It's oh, SES, it's yeah. SES, it's SES, socioeconomics. That gives you the outcome of that child right there. So I don't know, but some structural, basic structural thing has to, uh, has to be different, um, I think. I don't know, have you thought of something like that? Well, I think you're right in an area that illustrates how hard it is to actually be effectively active on these on these issues, because of course, uh, having a federal school system, I'm sure we could all debate back and forth on it, but th it's in the constitution that uh, schools are in the purview of state. So we'd be going for a constitutional amendment. Um, we've got a, uh, one of our meetings out here actually is trying to start um, or, or join STEAM to amend the 13th amendment, which allows um, prison to be uh, slavery. So when you get into things that require constitutional amendments, you're looking at a really uh, long-term issue, no question about it. So do you then not do the uh, small things? So in the state of Washington, for instance, um, we can we can do things in our with our Quaker lobby group that strengthen the hand or strengthen programs is actually what's realistic in Washington. Um, state programs for schools that distribute differential resources to schools with uh, needy students, um, and that's something that moves in the right direction. It doesn't change the whole system all at once. I mean, there's I think all of us in our heads could say, oh yeah, it, it's just crazy having schools funded by local taxes, it's often property uh, taxes and allowing rich parents to bring in more resources out of their resource rich environments to create these big disparities in, in schools. That's crazy. But the question is, how do we get from here to there? And that's the difficulty of doing the kind of thing that I'm doing, which is I'm, I, so with our police dialogue, makes me feel better. What difference does it make to anybody else? So I actually, I realized that, um, that if my putting effort into this could keep even one person from being sent to prison and separated from their family in the time that I live in Redmond, that would be so huge for that one person that it's really worth my time. Um, to uh, put into it. So I, it's difficult, it's really hard doing social change, isn't it? Yes, very have, hard. Have your own examples, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, yes, it's very hard. And um, sometimes social change is a little easier during crisis time, I found, at least in the healthcare thing. I, um, but maybe it's not federal, but even in a state, even in a city, you know, really, in, in the part of Boston you're in, it just determines what's going to happen to you pretty much. So. Uh, thank you, Sally. Uh, we need to allow uh, sure. some other questions in our limited time. Does anyone else have a question that they would like to ask quickly? Uh, Rod. One question I always ask is about realtors when you're talking about housing. I mean, working with planning boards, realtors are often part of the problem, but they also can be part of the solution. So I was curious whether you've looked at that area. Um, I have not yet, um, but it, it's another nice example. So um, I hope there's testing going on on housing discrimination here and in uh, uh, other places. Too. I know I used to live in Atlanta and we'd have faculty coming into Georgia Tech who were being steered in terms of the neighborhoods they were going to. And this is in the uh, 2000s, this is way after Fair Housing Act. So one of the things that citizens could do actually is some testing, probably. I don't know what, it, 
what the legality of that is, but that could be done. Um, but what the nice, one of the good things about doing the Quaker state level lobby is that you see the other lobbies, they are special interest lobbies and we're there um, uh, speaking up and meeting with our representatives or on more general human, um, uh, human interests and human values. Our, our new lobbyist actually was asked just yesterday in a retreat, okay, well, what, to, what difference does Quaker voice bring? And she said, you speak with moral authority because there aren't a lot of people speaking to these representatives who care about human beings rather than uh, a special interest of some sort. And so the real estate lobbies, they're out there. They're well funded. They are well connected to the cities. And so the, the, you know, the cities actually like Redmond play a role in all that and and we have a voice and we know we've got some skills we know how to how to lobby but absolutely it, i mean it's so many aspects of the structure in the racism may i ask a question you with your quaker voice lobby uh fighting against the other lobbyists the other lobbyists have the possibility of having graft that is they can give politicians money in different ways to support their elections or whatever else. Is that something that makes it difficult for you to have the legislatures adopt uh, morally good policies as opposed to something that's in the interest of somebody who can give them money? Yeah. Um, of course. Yeah, I mean, that's that's part of the, the structural imbalance. But I, I have to say that we do have people in uh, who are part of Quaker Voice on Washington Public Policy who are also involved in local uh, electoral politics. And I'm sure that they donate um, to to candidates. I'm sure that the, the money on our environmental stewardship side doesn't come anywhere close to what the oil companies spend when the transportation bills come up. Um, but yep, uh, uh, all those imbalances, all those imbalances are all part of the, the structure. And it's really hard to think of ways that we can even make it budge a little bit and we don't break free of it completely. Yeah, so um, Catherine. Yes, um, I taught at Overlake for 10 years about and of uh, the school there. And I know that there are some really good teachers and really working on community. I don't think they know a lot of these facts about Redmond because Redmond does not seem like a home community. People are all over the place. You know, it's all, all the east sides connected sort of. And so I, I think that there's a huge resource in helping a school, any of the good schools, <laughs> um, feel like this is my place and this is what I can work on. But my question is, um, right now, it seems like Redmond's in the news because of trying to deny the silver cloud for homeless. Uh, and, and for me, it seems to me that Redmond should show this can work. We can make this a really good comprehensive way to help people. We've got, we, we can do it. You know, we're not overwhelmed. And I know places like Mercer Island won't even let a homeless person walk down the street. I, I mean, that's a huge thing on the east side. I mean, but anyway, my okay. point is, is this trying to maintain a model homeless situation in the middle of affluence? Is that something that draws people of morality together? I think it should draw the schools together where they say, here's a place we can serve. <laughs> that's a really good question. Just for those who don't know the story. Um, the, um, the localities, in this case, King County, have been looking at um, hotel properties that have gone onto the market because of the drop in uh, hotel occupancy with COVID. And they're, they're just ready made to become um, uh, facilities for, um, for rehabilitation for, for homeless people. And there's one that has been purchased by the county. It's right on the edge of Redmond and uh, Bellevue, and it's, I'm trying to remember the phrase for it, but it's wraparound services uh, for people who need an extended period of time for, uh, for rehab. And the 
and this affluent community around it is just this is the lightest thing to be up in up in arms about you know i don't want my kids near these people um and and they're th these the people we're talking about are really difficult people right they've got mental health uh, problem. So it's not completely uh, unrealistic to say, okay, these are not going to be just like the other residents of the of the neighborhood. But so to Catherine's point, um, I have not seen the faith community um, standing up and trying to work with the um, people who are in the neighborhood of that facility. Um, to, to try to uh, smooth that situation and uh, and win enough people from the neighborhood over. And that's despite the fact that, and I'm in a, an interfaith social concerns um, council that like all the, the churches are, and we spend all this time talking about the homeless facilities and all that, but we have not stepped up because we could collectively and talk both to congregations where they are, but we could get out there in that uh, neighborhood if we wanted to. We haven't done it. So thank you for that. I've been worrying about that recently personally too. Yeah, my only other comment is that Seattle's big overwhelming problem is that homeless are all put there because it's actually zoned homeless almost. And <laughs> and so that's, and all of these uh, suburbs are contribute. They won't take their share, they won't help. And, and it's, it's a, I mean, I see that as just that it's, it's really hurting Seattle and it affects home prices because people are going to pay $4,000 for an apartment on the East side. So they won't have to be in Seattle where they're home. I mean, it, it's, a, it's organic. It's, it's a big. So anyway, I, I really think that's a point. It, it is. And, um, and it's being taken on in various ways, including our, our quicker voice economic justice group just decided to, there's um, a legislative initiative this year on uh, mental health and connected to homelessness because the families, the problems are very uh, connected. If you weren't mentally ill before you became homeless, you will be shortly from sleeping outside in, uh, uh, in camps. Um, and so we're going to be working together, but even these very liberal cities, you know, as from what you saw from the, the Redmond website, trying to sell itself as a very progressive place and not stepping up as much as uh, is needed. May I just say one more tiny thing? May That's I say just one more tiny thing? And that is uh, the international community. See, so like Overlake has all these international students. They bring another viewpoint. They bring different uh, they bring different research. They, but that's, uh, to me, if you have that many people of Asian background, then this becomes, well, is there another way to look at it? How do we bring everybody together around? I mean, that's, that's a huge um, other possibility here. And it can go either forward or backward, it seems. Yeah. Uh, the discussion, there are some, um, there's been, for instance, some opposition from um, Asian parent groups to the equity plan that's been introduced in Lake Washington School District. It's very, very complicated, and I'm only starting to uh, to learn about it. But it's clearly part of the complication of justice discussions um, in the Seattle area uh, because we're part of the Pacific community. Um, go ahead, Carol. I'm here, Susan. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to hear this work. And I'm very impressed by the Quaker Lobby Group. Um, you've answered most of my questions. And thank you all for, for sharing or asking really rich questions. We're just a small meeting ourselves. But I like the fact that you are gathering some allies. And the points you've made about your approach to this, uh, the school uh, and other services, looking at social services seems to be a powerful model. When you perfect what you think um, has worked, we can share this with more Quakers and have a, a I'm in the old school fashion of toolkits. We uh, have people in our meeting who work with restorative justice and I think so much 
about how these things pair. So I've learned and I'm heartfelt from you about trying to make more allies. And I'd like it that you've gotten your word out, but please also share what you think work, you know, and what didn't. And the way you explained it was beautiful. So if we're looking at another city, I'm from Augusta, Georgia, or which is where I actually I grew up. And some of the same things are going on. And you know Augusta from Atlanta in a certain sense. But um, it's just nice to have a model. So I've asked um, various Quaker groups in our various uh, meetings to try to get out the points of the toolkit things that we think did work or how we started or, or what didn't go. And whether you have um, your committees or your political, because I know uh, Brenda Nolan knows about working with the legislature. Some of us know things that I don't know. But if we had just a little toolkit of where we could start, uh, especially also in our meeting and opening that up in whatever ways. And I'm not uh, going to talk much longer because we were going to go over to see another church have a meeting about the Afghans who are coming to the city. So I won't say, I don't know if they're gonna have the meeting still or not, but it's wonderful hearing you. And I hope we'll um, you know, get to get uh, to share more and you'll also give us your toolkit. I hope I haven't spoken for the whole meeting, but I've spoken from my heart. Thank you. No, I agree I with I think yeah. it's a great idea to gather up the experience of Quakers with the interfaith uh, yeah. groups because we're clearly we're not all the same. Right. And there are pros and cons. But that's the a big pathway for lots of Quakers because there's so few of us. No point in going it alone. Mm -hmm. uh, may I ask, uh, Brenda, you uh, the host or some who what was the time limit supposed to be on this meeting? Does this anybody... was scheduled for, for one hour. <laughs> well, we've certainly run over that. Um, but if anyone else has any pressing questions, please, why don't we just entertain? For example, Molly, have you had any thoughts you want to bring up? Or No, I wanted to amplify what Caroline said and how Impressed I was, for example, when you gave the examples of, of approaching the police department and the kinds of data and questions that you were gathering, that's very helpful for a group that wants to inter interface with police to know, well, now, what are some of the things we should be looking for and asking? So that, that, was, that was very helpful to hear as an example, and I'm sure that there are many more that you have in your toolkit. <laughs> So and and thank you very, very much, Susan. Thank you so much for coming. Oh, you're welcome. And thank you. I think there's at least three of you here that may have heard this twice, and it was pretty much the same thing. So, um, But at any rate, yes, um, we're learning from the other progressive groups about that. One of the other groups has made 20 public information requests of their police department and kind of studying what did they ask for, how did they ask for it, mm -hmm. um, and we're, we're learning that skill. Well, uh, yes, Sarah. Well, I, I can't help ask, and you may have said this. I mean, was did you meet? Did you show these numbers to the police chief? Yeah. And was presumably he um, surprised? What was the reaction? And and was there a promise to look into this and make corrective action? Uh, so we sent them in writing we sent a letter to him when we first saw them so that it would actually be kind of recorded that we had brought these forward we have not had a direct response on that but when we checked in again recently one of our first questions we had been kind of quiet for a while doing separate things and when we we checked in our first question was going to be what did you do with the data that we shared with you and we didn't get a direct answer to that either, but they did tell us about this very significant effort that's going on on addressing implicit bias, not just in the police department, but actually all the city employees are going through a kind of interim training this year. And the police department is actually from scratch studying implicit bias training and what works and developing their own training uh, program. So we're going to be able to sit in both. We're going to try and get into one of the interim sessions and later, but it 
demonstrates to me why we're approach why it's a good thing that we're approaching this as a partnership rather than their cops and we're we're good guys um, because I think we all do have the same goal. So they know we're out there. They if they say, oh well, we're going to put this implicit bias stuff on the back burner for a while and address shoplifting or something. We're going to be on them. Um, and we know enough now to be on them. But given that we're working on the same goal, then just having us monitor, keep asking the questions, and then doing our part. They actually can't do the community work. They have a whole training course that they can give to store employees on not um, uh, profiling uh, customers. Uh, and uh, But they can't go into a store and say, we'd like to do this training for you. So that's a place where if we go and have dialogues with store employees, with managers, with owners, with a little handout on here's what, uh, here's experiences with profiling in Redmond, and here's training that you can get from the police, then that really um, works as a partnership. We're working together because the community is clearly part of the problem. No question about it. Thank you. This Not is the whole wonderful. problem, but the part. I think you present a wonderful model for what people can do in other communities to shine light on the on the disparities in all sorts of issues, but particularly the arrest records. It's inspiring. I'm a, I'm a retired data nerd. Go for it. Go for it. I'm probably not going to, but I'm. There's some younger people I might have some influence on. <laughs> Yeah, because so you just get somebody to do the public information request. I don't know what your process is if you're all in Massachusetts, but um, actually, and then, I, I'm in Key Largo, Florida, so we have Monroe County. <laughs> so I'm wow. in very fertile ground for this kind of work. <laughs> okay, all right, you're spread all over just like we are. Yeah, I'm wondering, uh, is it possible that the um, Quaker Voice organization could try to be a national organization with elements in all of the states rather than just a few. And that this toolkit idea that was suggested to be something that uh, could be shared. There was a, mm -hmm. another organization that spontaneously came up. Uh, I can't remember the name, but it was uh, one where, where they said, this is how you uh, fight election problems. Oh, okay. democracy now or something. Yeah. 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 It can, it, would it be useful to try to start some kind of a national movement like the Quaker Voice thing to address things at the state, in each state level? Because we know we, we, know we have these problems in some of the states that are very uh, anti-equality. Uh, I mean, they're doing it on the basis of critical race theory now and trying to say, well, we got to avoid having subsidies to schools uh, given out by and, and rules that control how education is done because we want to have it the way we want it. But we need to have a young a set of uh, youth growing up who are not going to be uh, unaware of what the true history of America is. And because so, otherwise they would just be complacent and think, oh, this is a beautiful place and I deserve everything I have because I earned it myself without any other support from anywhere else. And we need to be able to have these things offered across to all people, good education with quality teachers, with good uh, uh, facilities and so forth. So I'm just wondering if a national movement of some sort could be envision with Quaker Voice? So just to let you know, there is a little network. There are six Quaker state level lobby groups, um, as far as I know at this point, and I've been working with FCNL and AFSC on um, uh, kind of identifying some of them. And we do actually have a little network. It's called the Quaker State Level Advocacy Network. Um, but it's it we're not forming a movement at this point about um, particular things. So I like the idea of actually using that group to, um, to maybe um, create some toolkits. And we are starting to do issue-focused um, 
uh, open sessions. The next one will be on uh, prison work on Quaker prison work at state level, which is where the real action is on on uh, prisons, either mid December or maybe mid mid uh, January. But the doing more of a, a toolkit for Quaker Quakers who are trying to act in various areas, and it's going to be different toolkits. I think would be really interesting. It's it's amazing to me how weak um, peace and social concerns efforts are in some of our yearly meetings out here in the West. At any rate, there's a lot more we could be doing to share with each other about about how we're going about what we're doing. Thanks for that suggestion. If there are no more questions, maybe we should give our uh, Zoom host a, a break and uh, say thank you so much for uh, a wonderful presentation, very enlightening, and I hope that more and more people can can hear this in different situations. Thank you so much. Oh. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation.